Greetings to all our viewers all over the world. This is New Birth, where we're led by a dynamic pastor, Pastor Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. We ask that all of you would come in just a little bit closer and be a part of this exciting service today. I'm Elder Vicki Lister, Senior Director of Membership Development. I've been here for 19 years. There is one thing I can guarantee you today. There is no place like New Birth. Come on in. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's time for us to give God our greatest praise. Here it is. I'll praise your name. Your holy name, yes. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. Not just today. than ever now this is a time where we need peace and Philippians talks about having a peace that surpasses all understanding and as your pastor of internet and innovation this is a time where you can do what we need you to do and help pass peace to everybody you're connected to so if you're on YouTube 
Share this link and pass the piece to every friend and family member in your phone. If you're on Facebook, we're excited. Pass it by starting a watch party, by sharing, by connecting with people around you and wherever you are. Just let people know how much you love them by experiencing in Christ and sharing new birth with them. It's time to pass the peace. We love you. Share that peace and watch it surpass all understanding. And now, New Birth, it's time for your video announcements. And we just want to say happy birthday. Happy birthday to everyone born in the month of August. It's your month and we celebrate you. Hey, check this out. Why don't you log on to newbirth.org and visit the Call to Conquer bookstore. While you're there, pick up the August book of the month, a New Birth mask, or the newly designed Kente t-shirt. It's all available for you online. Just log on to newbirth.org. Also online, check out our new newsletter. There you'll find all types of helpful information about our church and things going on. Well, hello, family and friends. I'm Pastor Kylie Slimmons, Executive Pastor at New Birth, and we're getting ready for the Word of God from our pastor, Dr. Jamal Bryant. But just before we go into the next phase of this virtual worship experience, I want to share with you a personal testimony. The Bible records in Psalms chapter 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Did you know that being a believer has a lot of benefits? Now I'm not talking about medical, disability, life insurance, retirement benefits, paid off, paid time off, fringe benefits. I'm talking about a benefits package that will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't even have enough room to receive. You know, I have learned that one of the benefits as a believer is that when we position ourselves to pray about becoming and remaining disciplined tithers, God begins to make room in tight spaces of our lives. A tithe is only a voluntary act of giving God back 10% of the earnings, increases, and random blessings he gave to us first. There was a time in my late teens, I was driving my car and I ran out of gas. And maybe you, like myself, have been there at least one time in your life. Family and friends, have you ever had your car shaking and it's starting to putt-putt? It's a stop-and-go situation. You're trying to turn off your car so you can turn it back on in hopes that when you turn the car on, it's going to get you to where you want to be. But in the trunk of my car, there was a small, almost two-quart gas can. The problem was I had a Ford Escort with a 11.9-gallon gas tank. In my mind, since this was my very first time using this gas can, I'm thinking to myself, it'll never work. And my gas meter people are be is beyond E. But despite my disbelief and uncertainty, that 10% gas can restarted my car, didn't leave me stranded, and took me where I needed to go. It took me to the available place that had more resource than I even had in my hand. And as it was with my gas can, so it is with the generosity of God. When we discipline ourselves to tithe, God obligates himself to turn on things that stop working. He obligates himself to never leave us stranded and to give us enough to get to the place where we can get some more. Hey, friends and family, I want you to email us your testimony of how you trusted God in a tight spot, how you tithed, and how God took care of the rest. Come on, testify. That's right. New birth, it's time to testify. Tell us how your obedience and trusting in God's word in the area of your tithes and offerings turned a page in your life. If you have a testimony, text NB Top 10 to 71441 right now. And make sure to mark your calendars for Demonstration Sunday, taking place on our virtual platform on September 13, 2020. We are encouraging all members and frequent visitors to collectively tithe that day and others to commit to start tithing. Let's begin tithing together and watch God take care of the rest. This is a public service announcement. We are calling all retirees, seniors, single parents, entrepreneurs, students ages 17 to 25, educators, furloughed workers, married couples, first responders, creatives, those in technology, and committed visitors. Join Dr. Jamal Bryant for a very special Zoom and prayer call. You don't want to miss this brief moment of instruction and impartation from Pastor Bryant. Make sure you sign up by texting NB Top 10 to 71441 and complete the ministry form. However, right now through Saturday, August 15th, it's sabbatical. Time to rest and refresh. This also includes King's Table. And we'll still have Sunday service and group therapy. And that's going to do it for our video announcements. 
Don't know what's going on in your life, but prophetically we declare wherever you're here is, anything can happen wherever you are. Miracles, signs, wonders, breakthrough. It's happening for you right now. It's happening for you right now. Yes. You are about to experience a life-changing moment. You won't leave the same, the same way you came. Cause he's in now very mixed. You will be healed, delivered. He's here to set you free. And because God is near, anything can happen in here. In here. In here. Wherever you're here is, say it. Anything can happen in here. happen in here, in here, in here, said y'all, anything can happen in here, whatever you're here is say, whatever you're here is say, I've got good news for you this morning, something good is happening here, something good, yes it something is, something good, something good, our pastor says it very often, something good is happening here, what it is that I feel the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of all of us who are in covenant in this season. Today, I'm beginning a brand new series called Making the Top Ten. And I believe that God is going to put you in the top ten of whatever your field is, whatever is your area, whatever is your demographic. And on September the 13th, we're going to demonstrate it together Believing by faith as all of us in unison bring our tithes into the storehouse of God. I want all of us to be giving with a spirit of knowing that God can do anything 
and he's going to do it right there. If you've never tithed before, get your mind right because September 13th is coming. Please hear me well. I'm not telling you to wait until September 13th, but I want us to make that our demonstration Sunday because there is power of unity. Can you imagine what will happen just like they did in Nehemiah when they had a mind to build? I want us to have a mind to give. Get ready because God's going to make sure that literally anything can happen. I want you to go with me to uh, the New Testament book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Acts chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Here's what it says in the New International Version. Now a man was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was placed every day to beg from those going to church. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter and John looked at him, and Peter said, Look at us. He looked expecting to get something from them. I want to preach for a little while on this communion Sunday morning using as a subject, what did you think was going to happen? What did you think was going to happen? Recently, I stumbled across a classic in the annals of psychology. The case was about undergraduates who came into a lab and entrusted with two different types of white rats. The students were charged with training them to get through a maze. Half the students were told that the rats that they were given were actually superior. They were nimble of thought and able to adapt. The other half were told that the rats that they had were dull and would perform poorly than those who are on the other side of the class. The catch, however, is that there were, in fact, no exceptional rats. There was no difference between them. All of them were the same age, and all of them were the exact same sex. The researchers concluded at the end of the study that, in fact, those rats that were labeled and typecast as superior fared well, and those that uh, didn't fare as well came in uh, the predictable last place. They understood why it was because the students had a perception in their mind. When they had a perception in their mind, it carried over into their instruction. In many ways, how it is that they performed was on the same level as to how it is that they were perceived. Expectations matched behavior. It is known as the Rosenthal effect. The Rosenthal effect. Unfortunately, not in cages, but in classrooms. Far too many of our black children are met with low expectations. And because teachers have been conditioned to believe that African Americans will not fare well in the halls of academia, they are given low expectation. How else can they justify that by sixth grade they are already plotting how many prison beds will be needed and necessary? By seventh grade, they are already tracking how many will be on prescriptions that, that will lead to chemical codependency? I believe that by the power of God, that there is an anointing on your child, hear this, to disrupt low expectations. That whatever it is that they thought your children would not be able to comprehend, would not be able to provide fair and exceptional testing in, this school year is going to be different. I know that the circumstances are strange and are not all that comfortable and paddleable, but I am believing that teachers are going to have to look at your child differently. Specialists are going to have to reevaluate. 
that their cognition is going to go to a whole nother level that the system was not prepared for. If, in fact, your faith comes into agreement with mine, I want you to declare all through uh, your keyboard, this is the season to break low expectations. In Chris Burdick's book, Mind Over Mind, he dissects how our expectations bend our hope for outcome. The premise springs out of the much-discussed placebo effect, which is the triggering self-healing ushered in by fake drugs. In layman's terms, it's the uh, notorious sugar pill where a doctor would give uh, some ailing uh, patient a sugar pill that has absolutely no chemical benefit, but told that if you take these, you'll feel better in the morning. They're given to them, and something strange, albeit miraculous, happens. That upon taking these uh, sugar pills or placebo pills, many patients exclaim that they feel better. They're doing so, hear this, because what they put in their head has impacted their bodies. The Olympics has even uh, secured the data that shows that weight trainers will outdo their personal best if they believe they have taken performance enhancers. If you expect something in your head, hear this, it'll take place in your body. I've got to ask you, with COVID-19 shrouded in the atmosphere, what do you expect for your health? There was a woman who had an issue of blood, and they couldn't find anything for her. None of the doctors could. And she made up in her mind, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, everything is going to get better. I wonder if you can have the level of expectation to know that uh, the Grecan philosophers that stole it from the Egyptian philosophers, I think, therefore, I am. That what it is that you think in your mind is going to manifest in your body. I want you to declare it not out of fear, but out of faith that I will be COVID-free. Did you hear what I just said? I will be COVID free. By faith, I declare I'll never be on a respirator. I'll never be on a ventilator. I'll never lose my sense of smell or taste. I will be COVID free. I believe it for my family that will never be grappling around a graveyard prematurely about a disease that not even CDC can cure. I will be COVID free. I'm not waiting for any vaccine. I'm waiting for the blood of Calvary to drip over my household. I will be COVID free. Get it in your head until it manifests in your body. Expectation is learning that there is something to look forward to. I like that. Expectation is knowing I've got something to look forward to. Expectation is an attitude of excitement. Expecting is uh, the term, hear this, uh, most commonly used for pregnant woman. She is expecting. Here's the critical question that I've got to ask you today. Are, uh, is she only expecting, here's the catch, when she's showing? Why do they only call her expecting after you can visibly see the bump? You should be expecting, hear this, when you know it's something in you. Every person who is anointed, every person who has a call, every person that has a God-given assignment, you ought to lay hands on your person and declare out loud, I am expecting. Do you know the raw audacity of faith that a pregnant woman has to have? A pregnant woman has to have the kind of faith that I am expecting, here it is, with a deadline. That there is a specific time that what's in me is going to come out of me. I want you to have the kind of faith 
that every gift, every promise, every call, every assignment, every nuance of the Holy Spirit that has been impregnated in me before COVID lifts is coming out of me. What is your spirit of expectation? Most exegetes, when they are approaching Acts chapter 3, do so with the focus being on Peter and John. Their heroic apostolic demonstration of raising up a crippled man so that he could walk again. But I want to zoom in my sermonic spotlight, not on Peter and John, but on the disabled brother. Every day of his life, according to sacred text, every day of his life, hear this, he's carried to the church. And he's carried to the church to be a beggar, but never brought to the church to be a believer. I better give it to you again. They bring him to the church every day so that he can function in the office of a beggar. But they never bring him to the church with the transformation possibility of becoming a believer. He had come to expect Christians who are the most philanthropic demographic of the nation to give change, but never expected to receive change. There is something crippling happening in the church, that people are coming to church with the posture to beg but they are not coming to church with the posture to believe. What has happened to the church that we do not come to church thinking our situation will be changed or transformed? We just want to be better at being broken. And so we figure out how it is to put mascara on our scars. We figure out how to shout in our trauma. We figured out how to worship while we are anxious. No transformation is happening, but we just keep coming. But watch what happens around those who are carrying him is that their faith is at the level of his because he's five feet away from the front door but gives the instructions, drop me here. I wonder if many of you don't even realize that subliminally you have sent messages for where people can drop you. They have gotten comfortable leaving you. Got comfortable believing that you're going to fail for yourself. How you got that much strength but won't take me an extra five feet? Because they believe, hear this, in your brokenness. But they don't believe in your rehabilitation. I don't want you to believe in me in the state that I am. I want you to believe in me on who I should become. You're going to lose a whole lot of friendships in your evolving. They like you as long as they can carry you. But they have no patience for you getting strength to be able to stand on yourself. You have any idea how many family members relish in your codependency? They like the fact that you need them. They like that they, you are always depending on you, on them. They love that when you are broken, you are their initial call. And when that changes, they accuse you of switching up. Here's what I need you to marvel and note is he's been in this condition from birth. And uh, Pastor Lemons, I found this peculiar, odd, and strange that all of these uh, preachers before me, better preachers than I, uh, preachers in history, always talk about uh, Peter and John taking them by the hand, lifting them up. Here it is. But nobody ever underscores the fact that nobody had to teach him how to walk. Wow. He had never walked before. This is not the recovery of his walking. This is his first time. Can you imagine, friends, that he gets on his feet and doesn't have to be taught balance? You can be broken so long. If I ever get on my feet, you ain't going to have to tell me what to do. If I ever resurrect from what I'm in right now, I won't need any coaching. I won't need any prodding. I won't need any assistance. I am praying by faith. Hear this. For your friend that God will do whatever is necessary to get them on their feet. 
I want you to type your friend's name, just their first name. I don't want them put on blast. Whoever is your friend who you need God to help them get on their feet. Get on their feet, God, after it is that they've been terminated. Get them back on their feet after it is that their mama has died. Get them back on their feet after that horrific breakup. Get them back on their feet after their church hurt. Get them back on their feet after that tax lien and levy. Get them back on their feet after it is that they had to struggle and survive just to find themselves. Get them back on their feet and watch God give them the balance. One, uh, that one nondescript day, Peter and John are going to church. They're going to church. Hear this to pray. Peter and John are going to church to pray. Peter and John, they're on their way to church to pray. They are on their way to church to pray. Peter and John are. John and Peter are on their way to church to pray. They were not on their way to see prayers answered. <laughs> They were going to talk to God, but they were not going to see God. Something is wrong with our prayer life when it is that we always want to talk to him, but don't expect God to move. Something is wrong when it is that you pray for rain, but you don't carry your umbrella. There's got to be something where you got to put your knees on pause. You got to put your praying hands aside and say, God, I done talk. Now I'm waiting for you to do. Peter and John had all that oil, had all that authority, but they were going to pray. They were not going to see a prayer answered. I don't know how you feel about it, but today I am believing God to show me what an answered prayer looks like. Today, before the sun goes down, God, give me evidence that what it is that I've been praying for, you getting ready to show me. I need you to confirm for me that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. God, my faith is of such. I don't even need you to do it for me. Answer the prayer of somebody I've been praying for. Peter and John go there to pray, but they are not going to see a prayer answered. Something amazing has got to happen that I, I wanted all of us uh, to be aware of is that um, God is still in the prayer answering business. And when it is that they're trying to go into the vestibule, trying to go into the lobby, trying to head into the church for prayer service, uh, uh, that man is begging them. And Peter and John said, look at us. And the Bible says in verse number five, and he looked at them. He looked at them. Hear this. And I want you to know why he's looking at them. He's looking at them because he's expecting something from them. And I want to know, Pastor Ross, why is he expecting something from them? And he's never met them. Never seen them before. Never heard them preach. Don't know nothing about their mirror. It had to be something about the cadence of their walk. They say, these are people who look like they can get something done. I want you to know uh, that we've been saying uh, uh, for years, I look better than what I've been through. For years, uh, we, we have been testifying. God knows uh, that I came through the fire, but I don't smell like smoke. Here's what I need you to see, Pastor Kerry, is that this disabled brother is asking them for money because they look like money but don't have none. God, help me. I, I, I want the grace of God to make you look like what you are absent of. How, I want people to assume you married and you ain't been on a date. I want folk to think you are a CEO and they got no idea you putting in applications for jobs. I want you to look like your answered prayer before it manifests. Peter and John said, look at us. And he did it because he was expecting something from them. You got to forgive me. I, um, I, I, I've broken every hermeneutic, every homiletical uh, principle that I learned in seminary. Please forgive me. That this is uh, the longest introduction of a one-point sermon you'll ever hear in your life. Uh, because what it is that I wanted to talk to you about uh, wasn't about the uh, college students at the University of California in Berkeley. It had nothing uh, to do about uh, this lame brother who's sitting outside of the church. 
I, I, I only got one point, and it's good news. Uh, I got one point with one minute. Uh, here it is, uh, friends, is that he looked at uh, men he had never met before with expectation and knew nothing about them and believed he was going to get something in return. I got to ask you a question. Uh, when you give to God, how come you don't look at them like you expecting something? I think I've lost you. Isn't it amazing that uh, before I got in the car today, I didn't pray over it. I expected the engine to run. It's amazing. When I got up this morning and flipped the switch, the lights came on, and I wasn't shocked. I expected it. Why? Because I paid for it. Amazingly, when I went out my front door, there was no eviction notice on the door, and I didn't expect one. Why? I paid my mortgage on time. Isn't it amazing when I picked up my phone to make a call to check social media? It didn't blink out on me. I wasn't shocked. I wasn't surprised. Why? I paid my phone bill. It is amazing. God is the only principle we pay with no expectation. Uh, we have been fostered with a false humility that when you give to God, don't expect anything. The devil is a lie. You got to make up in your mind, when I give to him, what am I expecting? I ain't expecting God to give me the same thing. I'm expecting him to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what I can think, dream, hope, or even imagine. I'm calling all tithers, calling all sowers, calling all investors, calling all partners. Stop giving to God out of tradition. Stop giving out of uh, church culture. I need you to change the prism of your thought to suggest that I need my mind to be bent. That when I give, I give with an expectation that something is going to happen. Every time I tithe, I am giving with expectation, God, you said it's coming back to me. And it's not coming back the same way that it went out, but it's got to come out better than how it went out. I expect God to be my sugar daddy. Make sure my bills are paid. Make sure that I'm looking good every time I walk out the house. Make sure that my health is in good operation and order. I'm expecting God. You know how greedy I am? I expect God to take care of my kids. That the tuition is going to be paid. That everything that they want to endeavor to do is going to happen. You've got to be freed from the disease of low expectation. I expect God to do this for me. I expect God to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what I can think, dream, hope, or even imagine. I get it now. You were never a tither because you were never taught expectation. Here is a man in Acts who never went in church but had expectation. Here's a man who had no relationship with Peter and John but he had expectation. I want you to have the kind of expectation that says, God, I'm giving to you. God already knows you want to fix income. He already knows that you're waiting on a stimulus check. He already knows that you got bills coming in every direction. But I want you to make up in your mind in the harmony of your circumstance. I'm expecting great things. I want great things to happen. And I want you to understand that this limited offer is only for those who trust him, those who believe on him. If that lame man had never looked at Peter and John, he would have never got the miracle. I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help is coming from the Lord. I know I'm uh, hopscotching over protocol. I know I'm double dutching over how the program is ordinarily run. But in this moment, I want you to come into agreement with me. That pastor, I got to expect something from God. I've been doing it grudgingly. I've been doing it sparingly. I've been doing it out of necessity. But today, I am doing it out of expectation. I'm going to get you to get your phone in your hand. I want you to get it in your possession. I want you to begin giving by all of the prompts that are available to you. Are you going to be broken? Or are you going to be a believer? Are you going to be a beggar? 
or are you going to be transformed? This is the season where God is getting ready to elevate your faith because he don't want you outside the door. He wants you to be able to walk into the door. I want this to be what it is that you are singing from now until September 13th, that I'm expecting great things. I don't know whether your level of faith is there yet, but I'm typing it on the screen for you right now. I'm expecting great things. And I want you to know what I expect is not always material. It's not always tangible. But I need God to do something for me emotionally. I'm expecting God to help me to calm my nerves without a cigarette. I'm expecting God to give me my energy without coffee in the morning. I'm expecting God to give me discipline over my flesh. I'm expecting great things. I'm, I'm expecting my child to not just run the street aimlessly. I'm, I'm expecting my husband to pray with me, with my wife to get her fire and her passion back. I'm, I'm expecting that this year is going to be the best year of my child's life. I am expecting great things, great things. Now, I can't allow you to just be hearers of the word, but you got to be doers also. Malachi chapter 3 asks the question, can anybody rob God? And a whole lot of us have been robbing him. Why? Because you expected God to turn a blind eye on your thievery. You expected him to ignore your selfishness. And then you have the nerve to pray for a blessing. Come on, collectively. I want all of us to move in harmony, in unison. I'm, I'm expecting great things. And I'm doing it by demonstrating it through my giving. I want you to get to the place that you are so nimble of thought that I don't even just give on Sunday. But every day that God blesses me, I move in expectation every day that something comes my way positive and virtuous. I expect God to do it. Come on, everybody, I expect great things. Come on, declare it out loud. I Great things. Great things. I'm going to ask you this. What do you expect to happen between now and September 13th? I told you every pregnant woman has a delivery date. September 13th is ours. We're believing that something is going to be produced in the earth. Something is getting ready to be unleashed from heaven. And I expect God to do it. Nobody said the road was going to be easy. But I don't believe he's going to bring you this far to leave you now. Come on, I expect great things. Come on, I expect great things. Lift it up in your house, raise it, say it. I'm expecting great things, great things, great things. Come on, Tiff, in my life, let's all raise it at home. Everybody say it. time everybody say I'm expecting, I'm expecting great things you want to say it too I'm, I'm expecting great things declare it over your family over your children say it I'm, I'm expecting great things one last time oh, great, great things. things I'm expecting God to steal save somebody I'm expecting him to still heal somebody I am grateful to report to you that um, since we've been under quarantine since we've done virtual worship since we've been outside of our sanctuary over 2,000 people have accepted Jesus as Lord 
since it is that allegedly church has been closed. Heaven has still been open. Over 2,000 have said, this is where I want to grow. This way I want to blossom. You've got to have a level of expectation. I know that this is uh, unprecedented times. We didn't know what it was going to look like. God knows we didn't think it would last this long. Some thought by Memorial Day, others thought by Easter, surely by 4th of July. Here we are headed to Labor Day and we're still expecting great things. I expect that you're going to get saved. I expect that you're going to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I expect that heaven will be your home. I expect through prayer, through hope, through faith that you'll make new birth your church. I expect that if you don't have a pastor, you'll allow me to do that, to be able to I'll pour into your heart, your spirit, and even your family. We would love to have you. The good news is that the gospel can go anywhere, that there's power without proximity. If you want to join our church today, all of the options by which you can do so is available below me on the screen. Come on, don't hesitate. Don't deliberate. You realize now, you can't beg. You're supposed to be blessed. I am not going to massage your brokenness. I'm going to pray that God gives you balance so that you can stand on your feet and walk without assistance and walk without any aid. 2,020 years ago, a wonderful conquering king by the name of Jesus. He died and many never expected he would rise again. But it was women that came early in the morning that knew that the promise of God is good, that he can do anything but fail. And as a consequence, 2,020 years later, we still celebrate. We're still mindful. I'm going to share communion with you on this day. I want you to run scary, rush to your kitchen. I want you to find a piece of bread, a biscuit, a pancake, a potato chip, a wafer, a waffle, whatever it is that you can. Because hear this, it's just a symbol. When it is that Jesus pulled all of the disciples together, he pulled out a loaf of bread. He broke it and he said, this is my body. He was broken for you. God knows this has been a rough summer. It's been a hard season. It's been a daunting July, but you've made it to August. And when it is that he lifted up that loaf of bread, he was saying, watch this, what happened to the bread is what life wanted to have happen to you. The enemy wanted to see you outside begging, but you kept looking and you finally found the one who reminded you that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He pulled out that loaf of bread, he broke it and said, this is my body that was broken for you. I want all of us, would you take out that wafer? I want you to lift up that piece of bread, that cracker, whatever it is that you have. I want you to break it in your own hand because that's what life tried to do to you. That's what it is that circumstances tried to do to you. Can I go further? That's what your bills tried to do to you. But God kept you together. For him being broken just to keep you straight when you couldn't get in the church. Would you please take an eat? He then pulled out a vial of wine. And when he pulled out that vial of wine, he lifted up that flask and he said to them, this is my blood. It's shed for you. The old hymn says, what can wipe away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. We've seen in the month of July what stress does what pressure does. We've had to pray in earnest for Kanye West, had to pray for Tamar Braxton. You've had to pray for family members who really have been pushed over the edge, pushed up against a wall. And many times you don't know what to do, but I want to tell you in uh, the words of that old storefront, the blood still works. Yeah. I want you to have that uh, flask, whatever it is that you have, whether that's grape juice, whether it's water, it's a Coke, it's a Pepsi. I want you to have it in your hand and know uh, that this was, in fact, representational of the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you did before this. This is a sign that it's going to be better after this. Yeah. 
because of his blood shed for you and I, would you please take and drink? Renewing your covenant, this is better than Geico. It's better than Allstate. This is your insurance for the next 30 days. That no matter what fender benders you have, what accidents, where it is that you fall short of his glory, the communion has been, in fact, taken for you and for me. I want to remind you, I got to ask you again, I'm pleading with your sensibility. What do you expect to happen? Now that you have sown your gift, now that you have tithed, now that you have participated in the remembrance of the ultimate sacrifice, what do you expect for the month of August? I'm expecting great things for the entire month of August. Every day that you wake up at the risk of looking crazy, talk to yourself and say, I'm expecting great things. Before school starts, I need you to look your children in the eye and tell them, I'm expecting great things. Please don't just offer what is, take whatever's offered to you. Expect great things to happen. Come on, everybody. This is our song. I'm expecting great things. You want Come on, to say great to things. Yes, great things. One more time. Everybody lift it up. Say, I'm, I'm expecting great things. We all are. I'm expecting great things. Our family is expecting great things for you. I'm expecting great things. We all say, great things. Family, it's Pastor Carrie here, and I cannot even tell you how blessed Hallelujah. I was by the service, and I pray that you were blessed by it as well. Can you believe that by the Father's love, by His grace, He continues to meet us here every single week, giving us exactly what we need? Listen, I pray that you were inspired by the Word today, that you were challenged by the Word today, and that you will never be the same based off of what you heard. Listen, you might say, Pastor Carrie, I want to become a member of New Birth. I want to join a progressive community of faith that loves me and wants me to get closer to the Father. If you believe that, listen, we want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Listen, you can join right now by going to newbirth.org. We welcome you with so much love and open arms as you become a part of our family. We're so glad to have you. You might even say, Pastor Carrie, wait a minute. I didn't get a chance to sow my seed. We would not close this broadcast out without letting you sow your seed. Can I tell you, I know personally what the Lord does when you make the sacrifice of sowing your seed and not just sowing it, but when you do so with a cheerful spirit and you do so in faith. Can I tell you, it's going to come back tenfold, a hundredfold is what I believe it will come back into. So listen, you can sow right now by texting the information below. Listen, we love you. We are so honored that you share time and space with us that you join us every single week here at New Birth for our virtual experience. Listen, on behalf of our incredible pastor, Dr. Jamal H. Bryant, we love you. Have an incredible and prosperous week.